Hello and welcome to Juicy Scoop. Well, I have like a real, oh, such a juicy one. I have, this is my personal friend from so many years ago, but also one of the juiciest crimes that if you're not aware of, get ready. And for those of you that are closer to my age, you will remember the preppy murder case. And this is my friend. We met at the Groundlings Theater. She's an accomplished actress. She's been on tons of sitcoms. Alex Cap Horner. No. Now just not Alex, anymore. back to Alex Cap. Back to Alex Cap. She's happily divorced. Happily. And she's actually a divorce coach here in the Los Angeles area. And so we'll make sure that you guys know how to find her because I really think that's great when someone goes through it successfully and can help guide people. I think being a divorce coach, dating coach, I think all those kind of things, if you're good at it and you can find someone who's good at it, can be very helpful. No, I'm not good at it, though. I'm terrible at it. At dating or, co- or coaching? Divorce? No. I'm just <laughs> That's no way to sell yourself. I'm totally kidding. I'm okay. a genius. All right. Let me just fill the audience in to this case because we a lot of people may not know about it being that it happened in 1986. And um, so this guy, Robert Chambers, who was very good looking, and this is 1986. So this is the preppy. 80s John Hughes movie, like uh, you know, Melendez Brothers or Menendez Brothers. I say in the Melendez, but Menendez Brothers, all that type of like, you know, the pink collar and the preppiness. This guy was um, arrested and eventually convicted of murder of a girl that he claimed they were having rough sex in the park one night and she was hurting his genitals during the rough sex. So then he, uh, put his arms around her neck to try to get her off of him and accidentally strangled him. I strangled her. And his defense was, you know, that it was not, that it was rough sex, that it was not meant to be. In the end, the jury was deadlocked for um, nine days and he took a plea deal. Now where Alex comes into this juicy story is Alex was a kid living in Manhattan with her parents. You were 16 at the time. I was. And he, now how did you guys meet? Because he also did a semester at in Boston, but he was kicked out because he stole someone's credit card. Or no, he got in trouble there. Then he stole a credit card of a friend of his. And the friend's mother went to his mother and she begged them not to press charges and said he'll go to rehab. And then he left rehab early and it, so where did you come in? Like, how did you meet him? Well, you know, it's hard to know because he had um, an inability to tell the truth. But mm-hmm. I met him uh, in the middle of my junior year in high school. So, yes, I was 16. And uh, we were at a party, I don't know, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Everybody I grew up with was, um, was I grew up in the Upper East Side, which for New York City at the time, still at the time, it's, it's where Park Avenue is. So a lot of kids with a lot of um, family money. Um, the parents were often away uh, in Europe or um, in the Hamptons. I had friends whose parents just one friend of mine's mom just moved to London and left her there with her nanny when she was like 15. And like we took her in for a few months. I mean, there was it was a strange. Now, what's interesting about you and me is we met at the Groundlings and I knew you're from the East Coast, but I really didn't know of your background. You were like all of us that you know, had an apartment and was trying to get an agent and trying to get acting jobs. And the whole reason I know about this, that you even had any connection to this, is many years later, closer to when we were 30, you and your husband at the time were looking for a house and you were nice enough to let me be your realtor. And you sold us our first and only house. (laughs) You were my first broker. And so... (laughs) You call me, and at the time, you um, you were booking a lot. You had I remember I went, went to this WB, which was a network at the time. You had a pilot we all went to the taping of, and then you had another show. I think you were on the show when you bought the house where you were like... Maggie Winters, yes, yes that's like a, right, you were like Faith a, Ford. Yes, you were like one of the co-stars or whatever, mm-hmm. a, a regular, a series regular. And, um, and as we're doing all the paperwork and getting everything ready... Somehow you like said to me, well, it has to be in this name. It, my name can't be on title. And I'm like, oh, why? And you're like, because my boyfriend is a convicted murderer. I did not. Did I? 
I mean, Did that's I the way you that? told me. Or you may have thought that I knew. You're like, well, you know who my old boyfriend was. Well, and I used I'm like, to talk about it a lot, I think. Yeah. I never remember you talking about it at the Groundlings. Maybe you talked about it to other people, but not to me. And I was like, what are you talking about? And you're like, yeah, I dated him. And I was very familiar with the story because it was such a big, salacious story. There's been made-for-TV movies about it. There was hard copy and Current Affair, which were like these hot shows that you guys heard me talk about when I talk about the OJ trial. During that time, the late 80s, early 90s, the there were a lot of shows just dedicated to salacious cases like this. So um, that's how I even knew that you wanted to have your identity protected in case he came out. And he did. He did get out in 2003, which was a little bit creepy. And then he went right back in. So we'll we get into we'll later. get into yeah. that later. But so so you're now were your fan was your family very wealthy? And if they were, I don't think there's anything to be ashamed about. I just don't know how were they because I didn't I'll, really I'll tell know you it. exactly. So I my family was not very wealthy. Um, my parents got divorced when I was eight. My dad was actually a um, classical musician. He had an orchestra, and I used to go to rehearsals every weekend. And he was very anti-establishment, um, very uh, did not like rich people. And then my mom remarried my stepdad, who's just an amazing man, pretty much raised me. I mean, my dad was around, but he was not very reliable. And my mm -hmm. stepdad was like this first sort of adult, sort of male figure in my life who really took care of me. And um, so we moved into... Manhattan into New York City. Um, he already had an apartment there, so we moved in with him, and we used to live in the suburbs, and then we moved out of the suburbs and moved in with him when I was in seventh grade. So, so was he your stepdad or your stepdad? He, did he, he have some some he money? Was, he was wealthy, and um, and you know not showy wealthy. We didn't live on Park Avenue, and you know, but and my parents have good kind of funky taste and whatever. But I did go to you know I went to a really prestigious girls' school. Um, I went to. Ivy League college, you know, I was definitely had access to stuff like that, but I always had to have a job. Never had a credit card that my parents gave me. Was not I? Well, it's because you didn't. Otherwise, he would have stolen well, that. Well, no kidding. He probably and <laughs> racked up a whole bunch of money on dr illegal drugs. So, so yeah. So I was born. I was not born into it, but it was a strange thing to be plopped into when I was, you know, a preteen. So um, it was just different from anything. I knew kids whose last names were like, you know. Rockefeller. I mean, like, it was crazy. You know, just very old American and white families. And when you're, like, making friends with people like that, and the girl whose mom is left her with the nanny, and she has a, you know, run of the house with her nanny by herself at 15, are you realizing how strange that is? Or because that's what most of your friends are like, you just don't, you just think that's normal? Yeah, I think I thought it was normal. I mean, aside from it, whether we were we were growing up in a wealthy neighborhood or not it was you remember it was the 80s like it just was different parents weren't like hovering over their kids and taking them to music together classes parents were like off you know at their own cocktail party like it wasn't right. it just was a different time you know i don't i don't remember you know I, I i never felt neglected my mom made dinner and you know all that stuff like we had an, uh, my parents were relatively strict compared to a lot of people i knew like mm -hmm. i had a curfew i just didn't respect it you know like but I think I didn't think it was weird. I, there were certain things that were weird. Like I remember going to a birthday party, my first like big invitation to a birthday party in eighth grade, and this girl had a hot air balloon at their f house in like you know some f ridiculously expensive town off the Long Island Sound, and she had a hot air balloon for her birthday, and I was like, that's a lot of so money. So people got to go on the hot air. Yeah, balloon? Yeah, yeah, like, that was part of the party. Yeah, I went. Yeah, <laughs> I went. So dumb, but yes, like everybody had a summer home or a country yes. home or. You know, everybody was well-traveled, and um, so, yeah, it, it didn't seem strange to me. I mean, I knew it was different. I knew not yeah. everybody lived like that, but, you know. I never knew anyone lived like that until about five years ago. Really? Yeah, until I started to, like, actually hang out with people from New York or, and go to – I spent a couple weekends or a week with Jill Zarin in the Hamptons, and I went to the one percenters. I never understood – when I'd see that on the news, who is a one percenter? I didn't really understand. Like, I'd always see stuff about New York, but I didn't understand, like, the amount of wealth and the generational wealth and all that. Because in California, there really isn't much generational wealth. It's like there's maybe not that's in pa yeah, yeah, maybe there's some in Pasadena, but there not is. like that. Not like the New York. Like, I didn't really get – because you always think, oh, Hollywood. Like, people have money because they're movie stores because they're in Hollywood. It's like, oh, my God. Um, a movie star money is nothing compared to like a Wall Street multi generational yeah, super wealth. Like 
It's unbelievable. And it's the access that every that you get when you have when you you know your family came over on the Mayflower. It's different, you know. It's a, and it's a different world we live in. And I think there's a, I think it's there's a little bit of sadness around it. I mean, a lot of people I grew up with ended up kind of a mess, and a lot of people did great, you know. But it, do but you think that's because uh, they had the trust fund, and maybe even their parents, yeah, had trust funds. So like even their fifty five year old dad never really had to work, and then, and how hard that is to like make them not possibly become drug addicts and depressed like yeah I, but i think the same thing happens up here like in silicon valley i think that's really normal now like these kids are you know i just was up visiting a friend and like every car they they blew out a starbucks parking lot so that they could they could take over the whole thing for teslas only like they they got rid of all the regular spots so that the, it was just for teslas at the starbucks i mean like so wait so nobody so nobody who doesn't have a tesla can go can park at that starbucks you have to park somewhere else because the whole parking lot is dedicated to tesla charging stations only for Teslas. Amazing. That, that exists still. And it's different now because it's all like Silicon Valley money. So I think there were people who don't sort of have the – they don't have the understanding of what it means to raise your kids with every single thing that they could ever possibly want and understand that there are repercussions to that right. too. Like I was grateful. I was mad at certain things. Like, you know, you, when you met me, I was waiting tables and, mm -hmm. you know, but I – I was I loved waiting table. Like I I loved having regular jobs and knowing that I could support myself and that I could function and didn't have to live in a fancy place. Like, you know. Right. I took a, I got to go on nice vacations and my parents would like buy my plane tickets and you know, they've been great, but I haven't I never couldn't do it on my own because And was I can't remember, was your sister older than you? She's older, yeah. Okay, so she was she at the all girl private no, school? No, she too? didn't because we moved. So she went to regular high school in the suburbs. Um, and so we had a different, we had a very different experience, I think. But then she went off and um, she sort of had a, she went off and had her life and moved to Europe early, like right after college. But so, yeah, we had a different experience. But she had a great life, too. Just, you know. So you're having fun. You're at the private all-girls school. Yeah. Good student. You're a like, junior. Worked, worked. I'm a junior. Uh, I was, you know, like just a kind of a normal kid. I wasn't perfect, but I didn't like do drugs or anything like that I just you know would go out and so I started hanging out I think in 10th grade actually we started hanging out at this bar called Dorian's which was an Irish bar on the Upper East Side same thing and it was just like you know a 15 minute walk from my apartment so and it was kind of a 10 15 minute walk from everybody's apartment because it was smack dab in the middle of our neighborhood and it was owned by an Irish family they had nine kids most of whom I knew and was friends with because they were all there all the time so and and wasn't it also sort of known as a place that if you were not 21 you could most likely still get served well yes but but the thing was is like when I first went there I had to wait in line like everybody else and then you know now looking back on it as a, as an adult to think about the fact that we started getting in at 15 16 years old probably because of how we looked and our youth and little gross like thinking yeah, back yeah. on it like <laughs> like because I have children who are so you, know, you didn't two even daughters. have a fake ID I did at some point I stole my sister's passport because okay. she had dual citizenship at that point so I stole her passport and that got stolen too which was a whole other story and right. found on a doorknob at Bellevue like two months after the murder long story my life was a little nuts a doorknob at Bellevue somebody had, I, yeah, it Bellevue was stolen at Dorian's the, yeah Bell, Bellevue is a psych as a psychiatric hospital okay. and my wallet was stolen my bag was stolen at Dorian's and then it was found I got a police officer call the next morning saying it was found on the outside of a doorknob of a patient's room at Bellevue <laughs> Went down and got it. Um, <coughs> okay, so you're going to Dorian's. So I'm going to Dorian's. So I'd started hanging out there. So our group of friends was, because I went to a girl's school, there was a whole circuit of schools. Like, like Ivanka Trump went to the school I went to. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. and I'm not proud of that. But so we now had- Now your school was private but not religious, right? Private but not religious, but we did have prayers, but it wasn't religiously right. affiliated. Like, but yeah. he, um, what I found was interesting reading some prep before you came- was he was not wealthy. His mom was no. actually an Irish immigrant who was a nurse. But he, he had a dad. She's a doctor. But they, uh, yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah. But also, like, what's who wrong cares? with saying like, she's a I nurse? Said, I know, like, like, that's why, amazing. What's wrong? Exactly. And she was like a prestigious, she worked for like, she worked for the Cardinal. Famous people. Yeah. Well, she worked with, well, yeah. this I found really interesting being Catholic, okay? Yeah. So he, she was like a private nurse or a nurse somewhere within the, the hierarchy of, the cardinal and the archdiocese, which is like the top of the of Catholicism, and there's one for each city. So the larger city you are, you even have more power. And they live like kings, these people. And um, and so she was like a private nurse for them. And so he was getting into the private Catholic schools, which were also very expensive. But he would get breaks or get 
scholarship or whatever. But he kept getting kicked out of them. It's like, oh, my God, you're here you are. You're so lucky to have, like, gotten in there. And here your mom works for the Cardinal. And you still can't, like, keep it together. Well, yeah. I don't think he had a – that was one of his strengths was keeping yeah. it together. I think he was just a – well, so anyway, I'll go back to, yeah. so I was at a party. Um, I saw, I'd seen him a few times at Dorian's. I saw him across a room. He was staring at me like laser beams in his eyes. And I was sort of, I'd, I'd borrowed my sister's fancy dress and I was sort of trying to be really grown up. I mean, it was, you know, 16 and like yeah. little, like little skinny Alex. <laughs> so with like, you know, a lot of eyeliner on. Anyway, I, uh, he kept staring at me and staring at me and staring at me. And I kind of like, it was almost like a dirty look. And so I finally went up to him and said something like, you know, did I do something wrong? Do you have a problem with me? Like, you won't stop staring at me. And like, I just want you to put yourself back in the mind of a 16 year old yes. girl. And he was 19 and he was about 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, Some people say he's short. He was, he was tall. And let me just say, he was gorgeous. Okay. If you're watching this on YouTube, I have the photos. This is Ugh. the, the, p- the people cover called the preppy murder dark hair blue eyes 64 220 very you know it's that black irish look which is the dark haired what they'd call dark haired irish people so he had the light blue eyes the dark hair the jfk junior look yeah he was a very handsome guy uh-huh. and i'd never really until a few weeks months before i'd never really seen him so I sort of walked up to him and I said, "What well, you know, did I do something wrong? I, whatever. And he just, ugh, it actually makes me a little sick to think about it because I was just so young. But he said, he's like, I'm not staring at you because I'm mad. I'm staring at you because because you're so goddamn beautiful. Now, I want you to put yourself. Oh, I already, again, got, ting- I already got tingles. You're 16. And, I'm and already it's like so this ex- man who's, who's really handsome. Not a man. He was 19. I was 16. But. Needless to say, like he hooked me from the minute I met him, and that was it. I, I mean, we just started seeing each other, and I couldn't tell. I mean, I don't even know. I don't. I look back and think about details of what we did when we were together, and I, you know, it was like a lot of talking about. Um, we we'd meet at Dorian's, and then we'd go home. You know, like that kind of thing. We wouldn't go on dates. He wouldn't like take me to dinner, or um, we'd hang out with friends, just like I think kids now do. You know, you yeah. go out with a group of friends, and so our place to go out as a group of friends was at a bar, which you know regardless of the fact that most of us were 16, 17. Um, but the guys were always older, and we were – anyway. So we – we I sort of fell madly in love. I mean, he was like my first real love in my so life. Now, so now at that time, had he already gotten kicked out of Boston University and already gone to the rehab? Well, yes. So – but I didn't know – I never got the truth out of this guy. So okay. what happened was, you know, we'd see each other. Um, we'd talk all – we'd have these long talks about, like – you know, what we wanted to be when we grew up and how we felt like we didn't quite fit in. And so I knew that his, the illusion that he was, like he was in the Knickerbocker Grays, which was like this weird little mini, like fake army for boys. They all used to wear gray suits and carry like little swords. And it's In Manhattan? A, it, in Manhattan, yeah. What is it, like a rich person's I think Boy it Scouts? was like, I think kind of. I think so. <laughs> like it was very strange. So I knew he was But it was like a that. real organization it was or someone a real created organization. It. You can oh, okay. look it up, the Knickerbocker I mean, Grace. Okay, so I'm it was sure a real thing. Exists. Okay. Yeah. It's a real thing, I so guess. Th- which was an elite group which of kids. Which was an elite I'm group. Just, everybody, yeah. this was, everybody was in this elite group of okay. kids. That's the thing. Like everybody was, you know, the, nobody was coming in on the subway to go to Dorian's. Okay, like, whatever. got it. So <clears throat> he, uh, we, you know, we dated, whatever you want to call it, and I sort of was madly in love. And part of it, I think, as a 16-year-old was feeling like I didn't quite fit in and finding this person who also felt like he didn't fit in. And so, you know, a lot of the time things So did we, he was he on it? Did he reveal he that was like sort he, his of parents honest. were divorced and that I knew his, his mom had multiple jobs and that he no, was on scholarship no. or did he try to pretend like he no, was wealthy? No, he told me his mom was a doctor, mm-hmm. which again, I thought that was yeah. I didn't have any reason to question it, but right. then I knew his parents weren't together, but his mom was very um um uh, I don't know how else to say it. Like Irish Catholic, she was very, very serious. And I never yes. saw her smile. I barely met her. I mean, I met her a few times, but I only met his dad once. He was never around, so I kind of had the feeling. But they lived in so a really she, nice so apartment. So being an immigrant, she had like the strong Irish accent, the strong the Irish thing. accent, never smiled, like kind of yeah. scary, humorless, like just didn't have any, but like I, not not a warm and I was, open woman. All the nuns at my school were all she, Irish, so I was like, I know that Irish. She, like, yeah, it was just that kind of cold. Heather McDonald, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, <laughs> totally. 
Yeah, so... Robert's Kitchen here and finish your potatoes. Wow, that's actually really good. Well, what you did there. one of those that I had a lot. My <laughs> grandmother good. was from Ireland. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, so that was so that was our, you know, our whole relationship was really just meeting at Dorian's and... But you did meet the mom. I met the mom, mm-hmm. um, met the dad, but it's not like we were having dinner right. together as if, as, you know, like I, his family would invite me over. There was nothing, it wasn't like that at all. And like when he'd come over, my mom did not like him. She told me he was too tall for our apartment, which I thought was kind of an odd thing to say. <laughs> and I was like, okay. But, you know, she had very pretty strong feelings about this guy. And But, you know, it was that I was 16. So I was like, you don't know. I'm in love. And you're just jealous. And it, there was a lot of that. But like a, now what did she think he was doing? Did she think he was still at Boston she University? Didn't, what did no, she think he never was doing with his life? She would have come up with her. She never would have asked that many questions. It just wasn't something that we talked about. So uh, he told me that he was taking classes at Columbia. Mm-hmm. Um, ah, it's so weird to think about this. He told me he was so he did like go somewhere and say I have to go, and I'd say oh where are you going? And he'd say I have to go t- sign up or register for classes at Columbia. And I was like oh he goes to Columbia. Like never qu- yeah. crossed my mind that he wouldn't be telling the truth. He then one time told me so I told this story before, but he came over one time and I hadn't he'd been away I guess, and he said he was visiting his aunt in Boston, and I was like what? All right, like who visits their aunt? Anyway. Didn't, again, have any reason to doubt it, but he came back to my house, and he went up to my room, and he said, I just don't feel very well. I'm just going to kind of, do you mind if I just take a nap up here? And I said, sure. So I came downstairs, and my I was in my, you know, hanging out with my mom or whatever for probably four or five hours, and I kind of went up there eventually and was like, oh, my God, are you dead? Like, what happened? And I came up, and he had sweat all the way through down to the mattress, like, just... I don't know, like he had passed out, but he was like, my bed was soaked through and yeah. like with sweat or something. And I was like, are you okay? You know, I thought he had the flu and he said he had the flu. And in, and now looking back on it, like clearly it was he drugs. had been on some bender yeah. and like been on drugs, but I had no idea he was doing drugs. I had, I didn't want, I would never have wanted to see that. What I saw was this guy who was my first, who, the first like boy that ever really liked me, mm-hmm. who thought I was interesting or whatever and made me feel pretty and he was really good looking and I was 16 and so and I keep saying I was 16 because it's such a different you're looking at the world from such a different place right. than you would later um and so you know people bandy about the phrase gaslighting a lot mm-hmm. I am one of them because I that that was the greatest gaslight I finally watched the movie a few years ago because I was like what is the what is the phrase even mean so it's yes. a great movie 1944 Angry Bergman but anyway, um, he completely gaslit me. So, so what? Explain. What, so, what gaslighting what he did. really is is when you have a feeling about something that somebody's doing that feels dishonest to you, or feels like you're not quite being told the truth. And what they do is make you feel crazy for thinking that. So, uh, for instance, a cheating husband will mm-hmm. often be gaslighting his wife, or a cheating wife will be gaslighting her husband because mm-hmm. you say, "Are you sure you're not having an affair?" And they say, "Oh my God, what, what's wrong with you? You're so paranoid. You're crazy. Why would you even think that?" That's how he was. Right. So if I even had a hint of doubt about something, um, he would turn it around on me and make me feel like I was insecure and he'd get mad at me. And then I'd be like, wait, please don't be mad at me because I was also deeply codependent. So I didn't want him to leave. So I just let it go. And then a lot of those things started happening. So, you know, besides the little lies that became kind of bigger lies, he'd sort of disappear for a chunk of time and come back and have some story that didn't quite make sense. Um, I was working at a drugstore, like a pharmacy at the beauty counter across mm-hmm. the street on Madison Avenue. It's still there. And, um, you know, just my summer job. And he came in to visit. And at some point after that, he left. And he said that he had um, – my manager pulled me aside and said, I need to talk to you. And I said, okay. And he, he said, did you, you know, did you steal some stuff? And I was like, did I steal some stuff? I've never stolen to this day a thing in my life. It's like one of my weird things. Yeah. I just, stealing is not in my DNA. And I said, what, what would I have stolen? And he said, a pack of cigarettes and a lip liner. And I was like, I, did, I didn't steal anything. And it was just this little hint of like, wait a minute. He was just here. Robert was just here. And I thought, did, did he, like, did I turn around and he stole a pack of cigarettes and, and a lip liner? And why would you steal a lip liner? It was so strange. But I, some part of me in my gut knew, I, w- I know I didn't steal anything. And right. it just seemed, a l- the timing seemed a little odd. So... Those things started to kind of just tweak me a little bit. Right. But I just 
kept shutting it down and shutting because it down. He's because he's this tall, he's, gorgeous guy that likes right. you, and it's yeah. fun. And it's fun, and I felt popular and cool. And you, and, you, and you want to see him tonight at Dorian. Yeah. You don't want to screw up your fun Saturday night in no. the summer. And I don't want to be back to being alone and feeling like I'm an outcast or whatever, yeah. so I'll just keep it now going. Now you're in the in-group with the Knickerbocker right. kids. Well, yeah. But although those kids weren't even, like, it's funny because all those kids didn't even, it was like a different, yeah, the guys were different. They were older and I don't know, but... Anyway, so that's where that leads us to sort of the end of that summer, and that's when. This so all you guys happened. dated pretty much all summer, mm-hmm. and then sort of half the, the spring and summer, probably. Like. Okay, and, and then, um, and so now, like, so he's your first. Is it your first first love? Mm-hmm. First bone. Mm-hmm. You're boning. <laughs> mm. Well, that's, you got to tell that part. Well, but I mean, that it, part was kind of. I remember when you told me about it. You're like, then when this all happened, you're being questioned. You had to tell everything. I did. And you're like, that and now my parents have to know about this. And I think to anybody who's 16, 17, 18, 19, yeah, it was to awful. have it there be like confirmation with your parents who didn't already know that their child was sexually active. Like you're Which just back dying then you would never. And I'm also like, look at me, I'm sweating. Like it's like, funny. It's, it's so like embarrassing, it's bringing it, right? it, It's horribly embarrassing. I had yes. to sit with my parents and our family lawyer and explain everything and tell them everything that had ever happened. And there were a lot of questions about the, the sex, sex part because he had. Okay, so let's get to what happened. So So it's the end of the summer. Like, um, I'd gone, my family used to, we used to go to Colorado every summer and for about three weeks or so. And and this particular summer, I was just desperate to get back because, you know, I was going out probably every night. Um, Not every night, but like, yeah, maybe it was the summer. So, yeah, I kind of was. And so... You know, like I said, I had a curfew, but I would sneak back out. I had a whole system. And um, how would you sneak out? I had a fire door up in my room. My room was at the top of our. Well, that's we lived so in a New York. Story. And so I would close the door, but it didn't have a knob. So I'd kind of like pull it shut by the lock, and but not all the way because I couldn't. I, I, Wait, I, then would you be out and then do that el- that ladder thing and go no, down? No, no, no. I was in my vest, like in the hallway of my building. I lived oh, in brownstone. I see. Okay. So then I would just run down the stairs. I wouldn't take the elevator. It was only five floors. I'd Got run down it. the stairs, take off, and then I'd come back. Um, later one time I remember getting back in at like six or seven in the morning and uh I went up to my room and my mom I guess had discovered the door was open so she locked it and I was like oh my god oh my god oh my god oh my god I'm dead oh my god what am I gonna do and I could hear my stepdad in the kitchen like making coffee and stuff and, and you're I was out like, in that hallway thing yeah well now I'm out by my kitchen which is in the middle floor like my living room kitchen and I'm standing there and I hear my stepdad like making coffee and getting ready it's six thirty-seven in the morning <gasps> And by the way, I didn't used to wake up till like 12 or 1. So it would have been completely out of the ordinary that I'd be up that early. Anyway, yeah. and so I panicked. I didn't know what to do. So eventually I just knocked on the door because I had to get in. So I knocked on the door and my stepdad opened the door and kind of looked at me like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, OK, so here's the thing. It's Mother's Day. And I wanted to get up super early and buy mom flowers for Mother's Day. But there was nothing open. So shoot. So anyway, I'm back. Ah, fail. Whatever. <laughs> and... uh <laughs> He was like, that was the sweetest thing ever. And I was like, no, I, f- I wish I'd gotten the flowers, but nothing no, was I open anyway. No, I was actually anyway. with the yeah. preppy murderer. <laughs> right. And then I went back up to what, to go to bed, never got my mom flowers, probably woke up at four, screamed <laughs> at her, like, yeah, my realm, whatever. And she was like, happy Mother's Day to me. So yeah, that's 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 where that had gotten to at that <sighs> point of the summer. So anyway, so we were in Colorado and I begged my parents to let me come home early because uh-huh. I wanted to be home with him. And they did. So my mom gave me a fifty dollar bill uh-huh. and said, "That's for your spending money for the week." Again, this is nineteen eighty six. That would have done yeah. it. And so uh, I flew home by myself. And I remember going. I had my suitcase and I had this green Gap bag. It was like nylon. Uh huh. And I remember I took a cab from LaGuardia Airport straight to Dorian's at like five in the afternoon. I just went straight there. Just had to be there. Just needed to get there. I yeah. put my suitcase behind the bar. Like that's how. And he was, was he there. No, probably not at that point. But yes. I mean, pr- at some point later in the evening, I think it was, you know. And but what I was like there. your drink of choice when you get to Dorian's? We did these things called woo-woo shots. Uh-huh. I don't know what they are, but I think I'm definitely they were red and they had peach schnapps in them for sure. And Sounds something horrible. else gross, like yeah. <laughs> grenadine or, you know, it was like a grown-up Shirley Temple kind of thing. Right. And uh-huh. a martini glass. Oh, no, we actually did shots, though. But yeah. Yeah. We, that and, you know, nobody was drinking wine. It was like. Yeah. Yeah. So that was it. So, um, so uh, this is like, you know, it's hard. To, it's still hard to tell this. I've just right. t- talked about this now, like in the last few months, because I did this documentary. But it is like as an adult talking about what I did as a kid, it is still icky to talk about. But anyway, I was supposed to be staying with these two girls who were twins, also Catholic. Um, and 
I didn't, of course, stay with them. I went straight to my apartment, and he came over. And that was probably – that. I think it was the night before. So I got back maybe on the 24th or 5th of August, and this happened the t- morning of the 26th, like in the middle of the night. So so you spend the night together with so, him. So he's I spend the night – he's at my apartment, and um, and it's dark, and it's probably 4 in the morning, 3 or 4 in the morning. And he got up to leave, and I said – he said, I don't want to walk home this late. Can I borrow some money for a cab? And I said, sure. There's a 50 and a 5 in my wallet. Take the 5. Mm-hmm. And then he left, and for some odd reason, something just went off in my head, and I thought, I'm going to ch- – I don't know. I flipped on the light maybe three or four minutes after he walked out. Flipped on the light, and I looked in my bag, which had been kind of tousled. There were, like, cigarettes thrown around. It was weird. And I looked in my bag and opened my wallet, and it was empty. Mm-hmm. Now – for me to have a $50 bill was, first of all, I would have tried to save that forever. That was a lot of money for me. Yeah. And it was also my money for the week. So th- it was empty. I, like, white hot panic was like, oh, my God, did he st- What do I? So I gave him the benefit of the doubt, and I picked up my phone. We didn't have cell phones back then. Right. I call- And I called him, and he answered. And this was probably no more than five minutes after he'd left, and I lived a mile away from him. So there's no way he – he was not a guy who did a lot of physical exercise. There was no way he ran home. And there's no way. It, it was just not enough time. And he answered, and I so said, So what does that hey. mean? That he did take a cab? He took a cab. Okay, it yeah. means he took a cab. Okay. And I said, because there's no other, otherwise he couldn't have gotten yeah. home that fast. And I said, hey, I think um, you took the 50 and the 5 by accident. Mm-hmm. Expecting him to say, oh, shoot, sorry. And he said, I didn't take anything out of your wallet. And it was like, in that moment, I just, just knew. Just the blatant lie. I just knew. And I was like, oh, no, he just stole all my money. And I'm now, I have no money, nothing. There's no, I don't have an ATM card. Right. So that's it. And, didn't have a and card. this is this guy that I think yeah. I love and that I thought loved me, you know, and he just stole all my money and lied about it. And then all the little pieces started to come back together, the lip liner and the, you know, all of these little pieces just started to kind of click in my head. And I thought, this isn't right. Something's not right here. I just, there were too many things that didn't make sense. So I called him, I think the next day, I don't remember. And I said, meet me at Dorian's at 830. We need to talk. And 8.30 would have been like going like uh, you know, going out to dinner at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Like it was yeah. super early bird, not where when people would go out. We'd go out at 11. Mm-hmm. So I got there, and uh, he um, wasn't there. And then he was late, and then he still wasn't there, and then he still wasn't there. And I was just sitting there getting madder and madder. And I brought one of my friends that I was supposed to be staying with, one of the twins. And um, she's still just an amazing woman to this day. Um, anyway, I... I had a my I told you my gap bag. I was still carrying like my travel bag, no money. Mm-hmm. Um, and but my friend, who was also Catholic, as I mentioned, had gone to Planned Parenthood because she wanted to start getting being sexually active with her very serious high school boyfriend. So she had gotten a bag full of prophylactics at Planned Parenthood, like a paper lunch bag. But of, she was too condoms. scared to take it home. Yeah. yeah, and dental dams. And she was too scared to take it home. <laughs> So she asked me to hold it for her. So I had this big paper bag full of condoms and dental dams in my bag. And I was just walking around with it all night. I laugh. I mean, I shouldn't be laughing. But yeah. uh, anyway, so he um, so he finally showed up like two hours late, maybe two and a half. I think he got there at 1030. I'd said 830. I was so mad at that point. And, um, and then this girl kind of came up to me during that time and said, you know, was being sweet to me, kind of laugh, but kind of laughing with her friends. And I had this funny feeling like, why are, what's going on here? Like something was a little off there. I couldn't, yeah. felt a little like I was being laughed at or something. You know, when you're growing, right. you yeah. know that stuff. And I was like, ew, am I being made fun of? And she gave me a little bracelet and like we were all making those macrame bracelets. Yeah. So she gave me one of those and he had one on his wrist that I had made for him. I mean, that was just what we were, you know, we were, again, 16 years old. So... That was weird with this girl. I just felt everything was Wait, off. she gave you w- one of the bracelets? She had a little macrame bracelet, and she had green you. and yellow, and she put it on my wrist, and she said, this is for you. And I was like, why? Why? Like, I don't, yeah. I didn't know her. I'd never really seen her before. It was just strange. Strange. So that made me sort of mad, too, because I just felt like I was being made fun of, or uh-huh. something funky was going on there. Right. Like, you, you know, again, my sense, my instincts were sort of on high alert. So I would sort of stewed up this big big fat amount of I was really mad at this point because 
he finally showed up and when he walked in, he just walked right past me and sat at the bar. Like never spoke to me, never looked at me. And I was like, what is going on? Like this is wrong. Right. Because I hadn't even confronted him yet. I was there to confront him that night and I wanted it to be early so nobody would be there. But he showed up so late that now by that time all of our friends were there. So I walked up to him at the bar and I just said, are you um, – like, what is going on with you? Like, you were you're two hours late or whatever. And he's, I said this on Dr. Oz, but I, mm-hmm. you know, he said, I'm, you know, you can't do this to me tonight. I'm like, I'm totally freaking out tonight. You can't freak do this and whatever. And I was like, I can't do what? Like, I asked you to meet me here at 830. You're not here. It's annoying. I've been sitting here for two, you know, two and a half hours. What is your problem? And then you walk in and don't even say hi to me. And he's like, listen, I've had a horrible night. Okay. My little brother tried to commit, or my little brother committed suicide. And I was like, you're a little brother. You're an only child. Like, what do you mean, a little brother? And he's like, not my real little brother. My little brother from the Big Brother Little Brother program. And I, I started to laugh. I was like, are you flipping kidding me right now? Like, you're in the Big Brother program? I mean, it was the most absurd lie I'd ever heard in my life. I mean, th- this guy is not somebody who's spending his time, like, <laughs> helping little poor kids with their yeah. homework. Like, that's just not yes. who he is. And I, I, I almost laughed. I think I did laugh because it was so absurd. Yeah. And I was like, you're just making stuff up like as you sit here? This is so stupid. And at that point, I got really mad. And, I, I, you know, he was t- defensive and weird. And I finally just said, you know what? You're late. You blow me off, whatever. You stole my money. And he's like, I didn't steal anything. I'm like, yes, you did. You stole my money. And I just had this moment of opportunity. And I remembered what was in my bag. And I just picked up the paper bag full of condoms. And I just threw it in his face. And they all fell down <laughs> around him onto the floor, and I said, you know what? Use these with someone else because you're not going to get to use them with me. And that was my big moment. Uh And it was like, if it had been like a slow clap, I would have been super psyched. Like, I definitely was aware (laughs) that now people were watching. You know, I became an actress for a reason. Like, I'm a very dramatic girl. I was even more so back then. But I, I was genuinely upset and, like, kind of just like, I can't believe this guy. Like, he's actually lying to my face. It was kind of horrible, that moment when, like... When a guy breaks up with you when you're in high school or college and you're like, oh, I don't want him to break up with me. So that was it. I left. And I probably left about 1.30, furious, bawling, you know, crying. And as soon as I got back to my friend's house where I did stay, I called him and left him a message on his answering machine, which is what we had back then. And just said – it was probably 4 in the morning when I called him. And I said, just meet me outside my building tomorrow afternoon at like 1.30. I need to talk to you. 1.30 in the afternoon. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I, I called him because I think I was instantly filled with regret that I had messed things up. Like I was still, even though I had, I was sure he'd stolen my money, that he was late, that he lied. I instantly regretted confronting him about it, and so. So wait, you called you called him. You called the boyfriend. I called him. You called Robert, and I and went left home him a to my friend's house and left, and him, left a him a message. Got it. To he say, didn't answer. Meet me tomorrow afternoon. Meet me yeah. tomorrow afternoon because we never had okay. gotten a chance to have this conversation, right. and I wanted to sort of back out of. I didn't want up. him to think that I had broken up with him yes. because that wasn't my intention. I just wanted him to own up. No, he's so fabulous. What he done. Right. Okay. So, and that was it. And then um, the next day I showed up at my apartment and I was waiting on my stoop. I told him to meet me on my stoop and I brought um, two things of Hershey's chocolate milk and a pack of Marlboros for him and a pack of Marlboro Lights for me because we all smoked. Uh-huh. And um, I waited and waited and waited and waited and waited. Two hours, three hours. Finally, it started to get dark and I was like, oh my God, he's not going to show. And I was devastated I mean truly like I thought the world was ending and I went upstairs to my own apartment and called my mom and she had this very strange reaction this is before anything I was just upset that he didn't show Mm -hmm. up and she said you know what are you doing in the apartment and I said what do you mean what am I doing in the apartment I'm just came up here to make a phone call and she said get out of that apartment right now and to this day I don't know why she said that either it was an odd response but I got really mad at her for it and I was like why do you care about the apartment and I'm you know my heart's broken and so anyway I hung up with my mom and I just was lying on my bed crying and I don't know how for how long, but I do remember it kind of going from dusk to dark. And and then my friend that I was staying with called me and said, um, you need to come over right now. And I said, I'm not coming over. My face is a mess and I'm wearing pajamas. I don't want to come over. I don't want to go out. I'm really upset. He never showed. Just please. I just want to go to sleep and not think about it. And she said, no, you need to come over right now. So I did. I, I said, I don't have any money for cab, which I didn't. So her doorman, she said, my doorman will pay for your cab. So, um, because your parents uh, are still in the Colorado vacation. They're still vacation. in Colorado vacation, okay. and I'm by myself Got in my it. own apartment where I shouldn't be. So I went, took a cab over to her house, and um, she was standing on the street in her pajamas with her doorman. And I was like, why? I was mad. I was like, why did you make me come all the way over here, and you're in pajamas? Like, I'd gotten dressed. I thought that's what she wanted was to yeah. go out and stuff. And she had a newspaper in her hand. And she said, do you remember that girl that came up to you last night? And I said, yeah, what girl? That girl. Yes, I do. And she said, the one with the bracelet. I mean, I looked at it. was on my wrist. 
And I said, yeah. And she said, well, she's dead. And I said, what do you mean she's dead? We were just, we just saw her. Like, she's not dead. And, um, and she said, yeah, they, they think Robert did it. And that was it. And I, like, don't remember much after that. I, um, yeah, don't remember much. I know that my stepdad was back and forth to New York for work. And he was in an airport and saw a newspaper that said, like, the next day that said something, or maybe that day that said, like, Robert Chambers accused of something. And he, he thought it was me for a good chunk of time, like hours and hours, because there were no cell phones. So he saw it in the oh paper and just thought that this guy had killed me because it said Robert Chambers kills girlfriend or something. I don't know how it would have worked in terms of the newspaper, like right. how his name would have been out by that point. But I will tell you that later on, and then and then it all became horrible, but when I found out subsequently that he didn't show up at my house that afternoon because he was at the police station, mm-hmm. I was I was relieved. I remember thinking as this 16-year-old girl, oh my God, so he didn't blow me off. That's why he didn't come meet me. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so psyched. Like, so he had a reason. Like, he would have been there if he's like he hadn't been pulled That's into the- That's a pretty great reason to but blow you this off. this is what I'm saying. Like, this is where- this is where I was. Yeah. And I think where most 16-year-olds would be in that so situation. When, so when your friend said, and they think Robert did it, did you immediately be like, absolutely no way? Or Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think, no, that's not even necessarily true. I was completely confused for days and months. And actually, you know, probably almost up to a year. Like, I think everybody was. because Because there was an impression made by... Because it never would have happened. Like, who would ever think that somebody would go to the park and murder them? So his story came out early, mm-hmm. and his story was what, you know, the, they had rough sex, and he flipped her over his head, and then he checked on her, and she was dead. So we all believed that. And I believed it because, A, I loved him, or thought I did, and B, because, you know, I'd met her that night, and I had a funny feeling that something was going on So when with you them. met her that night, because then what I read was that, you know, she... You know, that she had supposedly – that they, she had had sex with him before and that she said that was the best sex we've ever had and or maybe that's what he said. And so, you know, she was aggressive in pursuing him is what the stories were. Now, a big reason why this case is, I think, so interesting today too is that there was so much slut-shaming about her in the press, this being part of it. Was she aggressive? Was she – Trying to get someone who who was clearly dating someone else. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. If she were the most aggressive girl in the world, 18 years old, she was 18, barely. She was going off to college the next week. Even if she were the most aggressive person in the world. So does that make it okay for her to be no, strangled to death and murdered and no, left under a, a tree? A, 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 so that's, 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 but that's my answer. But, oh, my answer absolutely. is. Absolutely. But I'm saying that was what was made the story such a big story. That's and why, why today yes. it's even more appalling because we're aware of how wrong that is to do. Which is a large part of the reason I'm even doing this yeah. is because, you know, I don't think it, it I don't think it occurred to me at the, t- listen, at the time, you know, this was a girl who was hooking up with my boyfriend or so I thought. First of all, she was probably one of God knows how many. I mean, this guy was a sociopath. He was a mm-hmm. liar, right? So he was probably telling her exactly what he was telling me, but he's telling, you know, I have a, a really kind of chilling story that happened later, a few months later, I actually met this girl who is now, you know, my age now, but she was this beautiful girl, like really kind of, I don't know. Anyway, she was this girl. I had seen her before. Um, she grew up in the same kind of schools and stuff that I did, but I had seen her once before at Dorian's. And so we met subsequently after the murder, after we knew about this, after he was in jail or whatever. Um, and after I decided that he was a bad guy. So mm-hmm. this was long after. And we bumped into each other and, I said, you know, that's so funny because the last time, I, the only time I think I ever met you, I said, that's right. I know who you are. You're the girl that Robert went outside to talk to. And she said, what? And so what had happened was months and months before when we were dating, this girl showed up outside the door at Dorian's and there were glass like mullion windows all around mm-hmm. it so you could see outside from inside. And so I saw her come up and I saw him see her. And then he kind of came up to me and said, hey, can you give me a few minutes? I got to go talk to her for a second. She's my friend's little sister. And she just, her boyfriend just dumped her and she's devastated. So I just need to talk to her. And I was like, oh my God, of course. Like, that's what so a great sweet. Guy. Like, such you're such day. a good guy. Yeah. Right. So he walks outside. He talks to her for like a half an hour. I've kind of got my eye on him just because I'm just looking yeah. around and also because I want him to come back and all that. And that was it. He, he came back in. She left. That was the end of it. 
And so when I met her again, I told her that. I said, yeah, that's right, because you, like, whatever happened with your boyfriend or whatever. Cause... And she looked at me with, like, absolutely just shock and awe on her face. And I said, what? And she said, when I showed up, he came out and said he couldn't hang out with me because you were his friend's little sister and your <gasps> boyfriend had just broken up with you. Oh, yeah. So the stories just kept going. So he did it in... 20 minutes apart, right. told the same story to each of us, and each of us bought it. So clearly she and was I'm messing sure around then, with him, too. And then when he got with um, Jennifer that oh, night, yeah. the victim, he probably said, oh, that blonde girl such a nightmare. Yeah, she's such she's, a bitch. She just, she's such a, she's insane. Yeah, she's ripped into me. And, like, yeah, like, I'm super I've jealous. Never, I, yeah, right. we don't. Absolutely. Da- I know. She's this, my, my friend's kid sister. Right. Who I was really upset. Yeah, because just her, threw yeah. some condoms at me. Like, what a weirdo. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So that's what that's what we were all kind of dealing with. And so, so so within like um like right away he is the suspect. The because, na- within hours he had been yes, picked because up. Yes, people saw him with him and also they He left with her. So yeah, once he they left. started digging into where she once they identified her, then they started asking around like whom she lead with and all that stuff. And the, so and they they, uh, they immediately him, brought him in for found questioning. him really fast. He had scratches all over his face and chest. Um, oh, and he said it was uh, from his cat. Right, had which, scratched him. Who was declawed? Right, and and guess who's the one who told the police and that too. I felt bad, like I betrayed him. I didn't mean to. I got they trapped. They said, "Does he have a cat?" He said, "Does he have a cat?" And I said, "Yes." His cat's name was Rasta. And I said, yeah. And he said, does he, like, is he aggressive? And I said, what do you mean? No, it's just a cat. And he said, you know, does he scratch a lot? And I was like, well, no, he's declawed. And then that came out later. And I heard somebody yeah. mention it the other day. I was like, oh, that was me. Sorry. Well, but I mean, sorry, I felt really Because gu- I, mean, yeah. I felt guilty because I didn't want to say anything against him, you know? Right. Like but I, how would you know? But I, yeah, I didn't. So anyway, yes, they took him right away and to custody. And then he made a, um, not a confession. He admitted to killing her. But he, from the very get-go, said it was an accident, that he had been raped. Um, he said that she raped him. Yes. And that— um, And the, the detective or so said, you're the first person ever, the first male that's ever been raped in Central Park. A lot right. of people have been raped in Central Park, but you're the, you're first, the first man. the first man I've ever seen raped. So he him. basically said that, that the sex was so— what, rough, rough. Rough and aggressive. They, and that, I didn't know what rough sex was. That it meant. was hurting him. Right. Somehow she was like squeezing his balls or something. So then to get her to stop. He flipped her over his head and she hit a tree and broke a neck. Oh. But what they did find was it was more like strangulation to the neck, right? Not more like it was. And I didn't know any of this until Uh actually recently. And I sort of think I shut all these things out. But I have now seen the documentary, which is really amazing. And uh, finally, sort and of, and the documentaries saw the on uh, documentaries on AMC C on the thirteenth. I think starts the thirteenth. It's five parts. It okay. starts the third. It's thirteenth, fourteenth, fifteenth. Um, I'm in the third episode and a little bit in the last one. But okay, that's it. but it's an amazing. It really is an incredible. I mean, so so then they said no, it was actual strangulation so, of hands. So the autopsy was confusing, but basically he yes he absolutely strangled her. Um, there was a a sustained amount of force for an extended amount of time on her throat. So chances are she was sort of smothered and strangled. And she's also bruised and beaten and, you know, stem to stern is what I remember hearing at the time. But then when I saw the photos, she's, I mean, he beat the living daylights out of her. So he beat her up and he strangled and, and her. Looking back, I mean, did you ever think he was capable no, of anything never, like that? Never, Do you think that it could have been that he was, um, now we know he's a current drug addict, and then he, you know, had did drugs while in prison, which we'll get to that in a second, and then went back for drugs. Do you think that he could have been so high that... Sure, but that's not... I mean, I don't think... I don't I, Like, I think about this all the time when people say, you know, because there was a whole thing when I was growing up or after this happened, people would say, like, well, you know, if you... And he kind of implied it in his statement, in his initial statement, which is, like, I got... He was supposed to meet me. I got mad at him. I left, he left with her, which always was, there was a slight implication on his part and other people's part that it was somehow my responsibility or, you know, that I was some, somehow at fault for him leaving with her. Right. Like, had you stayed. Had I stayed, had, he wouldn't you, have killed her. Yeah. And the other argument is, like, it could have been you. But the thing is, is it didn't have to be anybody then or ever or before or later. Like, you don't just kill, you either are going to kill somebody or you're not going to kill somebody. But 
he didn't have to kill me if it wasn't her. It didn't have to be me. Right. And, and if it was her, yeah. It like you. you well, just... there was another part in there because he went to once he got kicked out of the Boston University and got caught for stealing this girl's credit card. His poor, hardworking Irish Catholic nurse mother got him into a rehab. Hazelton, yeah. Hazelton, and that would have that it was supposed to be a like a six months program, but he left early, and the crime happened. On on August twenty sixth, and had he stayed his full six months, that that he would still have been there August twenty sixth. But he, I guess, was at a level where you know, since it wasn't a crime related reason why he went, like a real crime, so then he just left on his own volition, like he left that drug rehab place on his own. Yeah, and see, I never knew any of that until years later. I, I you didn't, didn't even know any he was of in that. drug rehab. Oops, I didn't know he was in rehab at all. I thought he was in college, so I didn't know he had come out of rehab. I. You know, I must have met him now that I'm thinking of it. I must have met him like on spring break because how else would I have met him? I don't I And you know, was he and, living at the mom's place? Yeah, he was living there at his mom's house. And it was a nice apartment. You know, it was like it was a you know And then what I also thought was so interesting is that the you know, the archdiocese, the um the archbishop of New Jersey and New York or whatever it was, York, yep. he wrote a letter on his behalf of saying what a great Kitty was and how, you know, and the mom is so wonderful and this family is so wonderful. And they had all these like letters of like powerful people s- saying how wonderful he was. Yeah. And there's a, I mean, I don't want to blow the documentary, but there's a a very interesting theory that I actually believe to my toes. Can I that. tell you what I think the theory is? You can. I'm, I'm not going to confirm don't or deny confirm it. Reading this, and I told Kelly this. Um, and I actually told my friend Danielle that works with us too. I said, um, you know, it says that he was a drug a drug addict since he was fourteen, and I know with the kids that have been molested in the Catholic Church during the eighties, it was um, the kids that were on scholarship because they'd have to get there early, they'd have to stay there late. The moms had three jobs and thought, well, at least he's safe with Father Timothy. And so my theory is. That well, you should also say what happened to Father Timothy. Wh- oh no, I'm just making these oh, names up. Well, that's uh, actually what his name was. Oh, it was. Oh, yeah, I'm just weird. saying. I'm just saying. You know, when it's happened in situations, sometimes I was. So I'm like, wow, he's been doing drugs since he was 14. What would cause someone to do drugs and then like the feeling so much that they become addicted? And then fail out of school. Probably then... a child who was trying to get over some trauma, and then who would still be on this potential murderer side than someone that also wants to keep secrets that he may have on them and the mother worked for it, these higher up religious leaders in the catholic church and i was like that's what i think happened i think something happened i think he was possibly a victim of um sexual misconduct of some sort within these private Catholic entities that he was at all the time. And he may, to this day, not even admit it. He may never admit it. And, there, you know, he would be the one that would have to tell the story. Um, but I, I just thought the minute I heard that they were writing letters on his behalf and that he was a scholarship kid and that the mom was the hardworking nurse having three jobs, I was like, this is textbook. It's it's pretty crazy. Like it, and it doesn't. I want to be clear that it, there's no proof. There's of no anything. proof. There's and no. As I said, it's just immediately and I, again, what I thought like, reading it. I it make it. I had the same reaction when I found out about that. Also, if if you look at what happened to that priest, he he was convicted of like a pretty yeah like no, he, a priest that he dealt with growing up or the Father one McCarrick. that the one that wrote the, one the, that letter. Wrote the letter who was a actual archbishop. He was a he was the archdiocese of Newark. Oh, archdiocese. So, okay. um, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't is want even. St- is that man still alive? I think not. I okay. think you'd have to look it up. But it's it, it it was interesting. None of that stuff. Again, like I I didn't know that. It, but the, the point thing, of the point the of this is, is, is profile, even if that happened, yeah. even mm-hmm. if that happened, which I I te- I tend to agree that it makes perfect sense to me. I mean, the kid was had everything at at his fingertips and then suddenly starts smoking weed and then starts to fail out of school and then keeps getting kicked out and starts to be he, he was like a full on thief by the way too he would go rob people and like he would copy their keys after sleeping with girls and then go to a 24 hour locksmith and 
to go buy cigarettes and then he'd come back and when the parents went out of town, he'd rob them. Like he was a thief. He had, there was like a crime syndicate. He had like partners that he would go. Oh, wow. So, and that was all discovered And there's later. so many interesting things too because he was the – he. in any case, I won't even speak to that because I wasn't part of that. I don't know anything about it. But what I will say is like regardless, I what I don't – what I always want to be really mindful of is that whether or not this happened to him, which I believe it probably did um, – not everybody reacts to that by murdering somebody. No, so, of so, course not. And I know that's not I what meant, you're saying. I'm saying more, that just because I, I meant, feel like if ever I felt that her family went through such mm-hmm. – I mean, I could. I have two daughters. The idea of mm-hmm. one of my daughters being murdered and then having her slut-shamed and doubly murdered, really, mm-hmm. is murdered so horrific press, to yeah. me. And that's something I never had any concept of when I was 16, 17 years old. I understood it was wrong, mm-hmm. but it never was my – cause to and when know. i came up with this theory the only thing that dinged in my head was he had been a drug to this person this they wrote somewhere because i was reading all the wikipedia so it was some articles that come from he had been a drug addict since he was 14 and when i read that that was the only thing that made me put the dots it's together really, and it has nothing to do with him then murdering a girl you know i just immediately thought yeah this is a very classic situation of that you know, um, you know. Look, every there, people people are victims of child molestation of all socioeconomic levels. But what I have read and found is that oftentimes these perpetrators in the Catholic or the school systems they seek out the kid that doesn't have the two parents at home right. that doesn't have the means that they're not the ca- the captain of the football team that's that's on the team all the time they're the ones that you know are vulnerable vulnerable, vulnerable yep. to that type of situation and they seek them out and uh yeah so anyway that's all i was no thinking. i mean it's interesting you came up i mean it's it's a like i said it's a theory it's been floated around i actually i think it's totally plausible mm-hmm. it makes the whole thing even sadder just just sort of what if that is true if it turned out that that were true which we'll never know right you know the impact of abuse like that and what it i mean someone is someone died you know and and who knows who knows so what would have happened so if he, that's he the goes, re- who knows but so he goes on trial but you said right after that time you're being questioned by detectives with your parents right so and, and your parents brought in a family lawyer just because to protect me so basically they've shielded me from everything and wouldn't let me answer any questions from anybody at all. So I was questioned by Detective Mike Sheehan the very first few days, I think. Um, there were a lot of phone calls coming my way, I guess, that were, you know, bounced off because my mom, I think I just found out when they were doing the documentary that my mom never, ever answered a single call and told everybody I'd gone to Europe. I was like, <laughs> I was just going to school. But like yeah. they, were, they were in there to their credit did not want me to get involved. But, you know, in my mind, I wanted to be involved because I still loved him. So, you know, I still believed for a few months that so what so to back it up, he goes, he gets arrested. He gets brought into the police station. He makes this videotape confession. He thinks he's on his way home. He's like, Can I go? And they're like, No, you killed someone, so no, you're not gonna go. But he's saying it was an accident. Like he just thinks he's gonna go home. So mm-hmm. um he doesn't. They put him in jail and I only found this out like from Law and Order like two years ago, but that jail is where you go before you're convicted, like right. after you've been arrested and indicted. Yes. But prison is where you go after you've been arrested. Yes. I'd say I didn't know that. Okay. Anyway, so he was in jail in Rikers Island, which is like, yeah. if you've ever watched Law and Order, everybody goes to Rikers. And by the way, they did an episode about this. They did an episode about it. That's yeah. Right. Um, and mm, probably like a month later, not even, yeah, like probably a Three weeks to a month later, I started getting hang-ups, like phone calls and hanging up. Um, and I had my own phone in my room. Yeah, no cell phone. So I started getting phone calls and hang-ups and phone calls and hang-ups. And then I got a letter from Rikers Island. And then I got another letter. And, and then what I got is he saying? Letter. Well, I mean, and, like this, what's funny, because I said I ripped these up. And I actually am glad I ripped them. I ripped them up for my own later on to prove a point to myself, but kind of wish I still had them. But it had nothing to do with her. It had nothing to do with me. It had nothing to do with anything except him. So all of his letters were, he's been wrongfully accused. He's been victimized. I said this on Dr. Oz, but like I remember in one part of one letter, he said, Mayor Koch is out to get me, the mayor of New York at the time. I'm like, Mayor Koch, what are you talking about? Like it was all about him, like classic sort of narcissistic, never mentioned 
that never even tried to explain in the letters like, hey, I'm sorry, like this was an accident, nothing. Just never spoke her name or wrote her name, never talked about us and whether we still had a future, which at this point, as I'm admitting to you, like I was like, oh my God, well, pretty soon he'll get out and they'll find out it's all a mistake and then we'll get back together. I mean, that so, was but, my... but even But you knew for a fact that he had sex with someone else that night. Yeah. So uh, if nothing... He was a I deceptive person who slept around right. on you, right. and you were going to be okay with that, yeah. providing, mm-hmm. you know, right. he didn't mean to kill this, this person. This is where being a parent later <laughs> is really interesting when you raise two girls and you think, oh, <laughs> wow, I have some work to do to make sure <laughs> these girls don't repeat the mistakes of their mother. Yeah. But yes, I mean, and who knows where that came from? Who knows why I felt... Why I didn't recognize, I don't know. Like, why didn't I, I know that was it's terrible? It's youth, it's love, it's... I mean, look at how they describe him in People magazine well, on the cover. Yeah. The preppy I mean... murder case, tall, handsome, and deadly. <laughs> right. Robert Chambers killed Jennifer Levin. She's barely then in there. Then dragged little... her name through the mud in court and got off easy. Here is the full story behind the trial that, st- that shocked New York. And that was after. But the that first at- original magazine that came out, which I re- thought this was, uh-huh. was New York Magazine. He was in that picture, like, wearing... Mm-hmm. They styled him. She was in like a picture this big. Wait, what do you mean? This wasn't a picture they took before they took that it was after? for New York Magazine. So he they, actually had a photo shoot. He had a photo shoot magazine. after the murder. Yeah. Well, I thought this was like no, a college no. photo. That was his. He had a cover, and Jennifer Levin had like a little postage stamp size picture, and it was all celebrating how good looking he was, how he was like this blue blood sort of, you know, handsome guy and whatever. And I was like, what the uh, what? Like you know, in all of this. And I felt like I had watched a lot on it. I thought he was a rich kid. That's what his lawyer wanted you to think. That's what everybody wanted everybody to think. But that why this kid would, his would lawyer... never do that. That this kid was so, you know, born into such privilege and wealth and he was a good kid and a stand up guy and she was the one who was from downtown and she was the so... aggressive one. So that's how they that's how he did it. He fair from the very beginning, his attorney, Jack Lippman, who was who really couldn't have? I mean, you know, listen again. Different time, but it does not make it does not make up for what happened afterwards, which is that they vilified her. No, absolutely, and created a myth I, about I, who she you was. You know, my and... sister's a criminal defense attorney, and we, she comes on the show, and it's interesting because I think if I was on his team, I I wouldn't think that that would make him appear better. I think telling the truth that he was. I guess now you're right. No, because, because the truth was right. so bad because he wasn't a scholarship kid that was successful. He was a scholarship kid that kept getting kicked he out of school. He was a kid and who got trouble. every single thing handed to him. He and blew he kept all of it. You're right. Blew all of it. Okay, so, so I see now what the plan was. Here. So and then you know, and we okay. all, and well, we don't all know, but you you know, everyone you will know. But what happened to her too? You know, she was just as much a victim from not being from the Upper East Side. She so was she was. And what was her story? She was. I mean, I don't know. I don't even want to speak too much about her. Right. I barely knew her, but you know, just from having watched the documentary. She she was, you know, she had lived in Long Island. Weirdly enough, I think we went to the same elementary school at the same time, which is really weird because I lived in Long Island until I was six. I, I don't even. I, it would so be something. So, in comparison to the but crowd, she, she her was parents not... were divorced. Her dad okay. lived in Soho, and Soho at the time in New York was like it was totally not what it is today. It's all gentrified and really pretty yeah. and expensive now. It was like seedy back then. Okay, we lived in a loft, which was kind of awesome, I'm sure. And her parents weren't together, and she was from downtown, and she was kind of, you know, she had a job and after school I guess job or summer job you know she was a different kind of kid downtown kids were different from uptown kids you know it's just that she wasn't from that world she Got wasn't it. from that world of privilege and wealth I mean I'm sure she was their parents are fine and she wasn't like poor nothing like that but she just right. wasn't from the same Click. group of schools and cliques and all that Got stuff it. so you know it was easy to look at her and think you know oh well she's an outsider i'm sure so then when did the video that current affair got a hold of well, come about so Which the video is why don't you describe what the video is yeah so well i'll tell you first because we'll just get up to that mm-hmm. point because i, I want to tell you how it ended with him mm-hmm. for me finally but mm-hmm. um after the letters came and then the phone calls or whatever then eventually i was Eventually, I talked. I talked to him. Like he was calling me. But wait, I have a prison. question. When the yeah. letters came, were you were you the recipient of a letter, or did your mom get it and no, then hand no, it I to got you? Him. So you I happened to go him. down yeah. to the mailbox and get yeah. it. So your yeah. mom didn't even know she the had letters no idea came. That I was getting okay, no. so, so go on. I got three letters, and then um, all the phone calls, and then I was having a party, and my friend picked up my phone and said, "Oh my God, Robert's on the phone!" Oh my God! So I was so excited. Missed the whole party. Talked to him for hours and hours and hours, and uh, or so I remember. It was probably like ten minutes, but what? Whatever. Yeah. And um, 
you know, I don't remember being particularly affectionate or, but I knew like for sure I was really excited to be talking to him, like really. Um, and now how much time had passed? since? So this is probably his birthday was like September 25th. This is probably a month later. A month after the murder. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. I remember talking to him about his birthday and was like, okay, so, sorry, it's my phone. So we went from the letters to the talking on the phone and then he, I guess that letter from Father McCarrick came out and he was released on bail and sent back to his own Because apartment. of the letter from the archdiocese, yeah. he got yeah. out on bail. Okay, so then so he's he got out, out on, on bail. bail. And I know that at some point, I don't remember this, but he stayed at the, maybe that was after, but he I know he went home because mm -hmm. I, I, I'm going to tell you why. So he went back to his apartment, um, I guess, you know, out on bail. I don't know what the rules were or whatever. And I was just like, oh my God, do I get to see him? Whatever. So my parents knew nothing about any of this. I was keeping this totally to myself. Ugh. Still, like I'm like pulling up my sweater because I just, the discomfort of, again, as a parent now, just yes. thinking about what the recklessness of all these choices. Yeah. But um, yeah, I went up to see him. I went up to see him. Didn't tell anybody. Um, yep. And so, um, and I'm repeating myself. Because, Did you get together? No, but I'll tell you what Did happened. You even make so, it out, well, at least? oh my God, you're, it's funny. You're like, like a freaking mind reader. What are you, a shaman? It's really weird. Um, every time I say something, she's like, says it before and she knows, <laughs> and I don't know how she knows. It's kind of freaking me out, Heather. Um, I think I have a gift. Go on. <laughs> so you do. God, you should have your own show, like the Long Island medium lady, except Woodland Hills Valley. Wizard. Woodland Hills, I don't know. <laughs> Woodland, Woodland Hills Wise Woman. Anyway, so, uh, I went up to see him, uh, and I told the son doctor I was too, but yeah. I guess whatever. Um, and so his elevator opened into, actually into his apartment. Normally there's like a hallway right. where the elevator door opens, and then there's a little vestibule, and then you go into the apartments or apartment or whatever. But for some reason in his building, it was a brownstone, but it had like the elevator door just went right into his living room. So I showed up. His mom answered the door, cold as ice, whatever. He walks out. He's wearing like this dark blue turtleneck his icy blue eyes he's super super pale dark his hair looks really dark and um and I was at his mom sort of like hello and walked out of the room and so we went into his room and closed the door um oh I just think about that so did you just climb on top of him no and I didn't oh. I didn't I was super nervous mm -hmm. I was a little confused um I sat on his bed he sat at his desk we started doing mad libs why I don't know um, it was like super conversational kind of, but I did, and I have admitted this before, I did think, oh my God, I wonder if we're going to make out. Mm -hmm. Like I, I wasn't sure, but I right. knew if he tried, I would have. And again, these are things that are not like, I'm not filled with pride admitting any of this because it's, right. but again, it's like the mindset of a kid and that's yeah, really and what I was. Missed, yeah, you just missed, Sorry, I've had a cold forever. Yeah. So, um, and at that point we were sort of sitting there and I'm, nervous but excited but not sure where this is going to go or what i wasn't thinking about tomorrow or next week or next in five minutes i was just like oh my god i can't believe i'm back in the same room with them with the door closed after he's been indicted for murder <laughs> um anyway and then he had this little old-fashioned like depression era wooden desk like a like a kid would have it yeah you know like and um like a newsboy cap yeah. desk you know what i'm saying and underneath i looked over and he was sitting where you are and then i was here and his desk was sort of right there. And I looked over and I saw that he had newspapers stacked all the way up to the underside of his desk, like all the way up, like probably at 200 newspapers from the last month and a half or whatever it was. And I knew what they were. I mean, and it was I all said, the articles yeah. about him. And I was like, wow, well, I guess I was joking. And I said, well, I guess you got what you always wanted, right? You're I guess famous. you're famous now. And he smiled. And the smile was like nothing I, I knew in an instant, I was like, oh, my God, 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 oh, my God. He did it. He did it on purpose. Oh, my God. He murdered her. Oh, my God. And it was like, I, I mean, I still, every time I've told, I've told this now like four times in the last few months, I still think about that and I get like ice in my veins. So I, I started to sort of small talk a little bit. And realized, like, I got I to gotta get out of here. Like, I got to get out of here right now. And the door's shut. And his, I don't know where his mom's. Maybe she's left. So I kind of get. She's I said, all potatoes. right. But I didn't want him to know that. Yeah, exactly. She's making potato soup. Yeah. Anyway, I um, I just kind of got up and 
didn't want him to know. So I was sort of like, well, listen, I should probably go. Like, my mom's going to want to know where I am. And I'm trying to stay super calm, super calm, super calm. And in my heart, my racing And, and that adrenaline. point, you're getting scared for your own I'm safety. Scared. Now I'm scared. Yeah. Like, at this point, And he had this, just the look on his face. I don't know how to describe it. It was like this smirk or a... It was like this thing, like, mm hmm, you know, like, I, you, I sure did get famous, and it doesn't matter how, but I did. Like, it was the strangest. Why? Would he talk about that with you? That <laughs> All he the won? time. All the time. What, what, what kind of fame there did was, he want? Did he say he wanted to be an it. actor? Nope. Like, how I would he knew, say it? I knew I wanted to be an actress. He never said it. He just wanted to be famous. It wasn't, there was nothing specific. Like, well, how do you want to do that? But like, would how, he say, I want to be, f like, mm -hmm. actual Yeah, we words. talked about it all the time. Yeah. Like, I want to <sighs> make an impact. I want to be famous. I want people to know who I am. I want to make a mark on the world, all that stuff. Well, he made a mark. Um, anyway, so I got up and I sort of started to walk out of the room backwards. I didn't want to turn around, turn my back to him. I, that's how, that's oh, how scared I was. Oh, my God. And I sort of backed out slowly. I was trying to seem really cool and cash. And I back out of his room. I got the door open. I walk out into the living room, press the button on the elevator, waiting for the elevator. And he's just sort of standing there looking at me. And I'm, now I'm thinking, oh, my God, like, is he going to try to kiss me or something? Because now I'm absolutely filled with terror, like terrified. <coughs> and the elevator came. And I was like, all right, well, I'll talk to you soon. You know, I'll talk to you soon. And I'm trying to be calm. And I back into the elevator and my heart was racing. And I swear, as the door started to shut, I just said this before, but if he had stuck his hand in it like a movie, yeah, I wouldn't have been surprised. Like, that's what I was waiting for. I was waiting for it to be like almost shut. And then he sticks his hand in and kills me. That's what I thought was next on my agenda. And the door closed and I got down to the main floor and I just ran 150 miles an hour home, burst open, you know, burst into my apartment, bawling. I told my mom I was going to go see art at the Metropolitan Museum, which is so ridiculous anyway, because it was 60, like, really? I mean, and so I had to, I told her everything, and um, and what I haven't really told anybody, but well, it's weird. He did call me again. It might have even been later that day or the next day, because I didn't, he didn't, I, I must have fooled him to some degree. I don't think he was wise to the fact that I was like, oh, my God, I got to get away from you now. And so when he called again on my, my own personal phone line, I pretended to be my mom. And I got my voice really low and scary. And I was like, if you ever call here again, I swear to God, I will put you in jail. And like, I did my mom mad because my mom was pretty scary. <laughs> and he bought it. He must have bought it. I never heard from him again. That was it. So now when he's home for those two years, wasn't he home for how I don't long know. Was... I left. I, well, that, then I was a senior in high school. I remember getting subpoenaed at school. Oh, God, I got, like, so snuck you got out the back door. I got subpoenaed by both sides. But because of our family lawyer, um, I was, like, a hostile witness on both sides. So And also probably being but a I minor, did, you know, I made too. statements, and I whatever. Um, then there was this other tragic death, another girl that I knew and was with that night. She died in a hit and run. So crazy. Um, in October, that was horrible. And then... Um, I was just, I applied early to college. Thank God I got in because I don't think I could have done one, more than one application. I wrote my college essay on, on rich girls talking about cellulite and what a waste it is. And it was actually fun. It was like my first, you know, personal Comedic satire. Piece, yeah. It was. It was actually like a comedy bit. Yeah. And I got into school early. So like December. So I never had to think about that again. And then just, I don't remember most of my senior year. Like I don't. You know, I'm sure it was fine. I know I went to Jamaica with a bunch of friends. and So, but when, with the video that I'm talking about, that then... So that came out, so I think that was, okay, so I went off to college. Mm -hmm. um, some point during my freshman fall, I got a phone call on the pay phone in my dorm uh -huh. from his defense attorney. And it must have been freshman fall because I was still 17 when I went to college. And he uh -huh. called and said, you know, I need to talk to you. You owe it to him to testify for him. And I was like, I don't owe anything. And also, I'm 17 years old. You don't get to call me, like, on my phone at school like this is so yeah. dead wrong what you're doing and I knew it at that point I guess I'd gotten my courage up a little but so I think it was maybe that winter or spring I was at my dad's house um ugh, whatever my dad used to like brag about it to strangers and be like you remember that guy that's my like whatever complicated relationship but I was at my dad's house and it was like it was a current affair and I remember Turning it on, I was watching it. I think mm -hmm. we all watched a current affair. Remember? No, like yeah, it was like seven o'clock every night. Yeah, like, it was what are like those watching shows? Entertainment Tonight, tonight or yes. like uh -huh. Extra or Access Hollywood. Yeah. Or, um, it's fascinating and gossipy yeah. and whatever. And I was watching it, and they had this video of him sitting in a room with all the with a bunch of girls in like underwear, and all their faces were blurred out. Turns out I know one of them. Um, met her as an adult. Anyway, uh, and he had a doll, like a Barbie doll, in his hands, and he's. Out, I guess he was out on bail when this yes, video was, was out made, on bail, which is yeah. even more horrifying. And at this point, now I'm completely clear that this guy is a sociopath and whatever. And he takes the head of the doll and he twists it off and he's like, oops, I think I killed it. 
and then he's in this weird voice like saying like Jennifer like it was so psychotic and crazy and like and flippant and wrong that he's joking about yeah, he's clearly taking joking the head off about a doll that incident with a bunch of naked girls and who are these girls who are these girls sitting in a room six of these girls sitting in a room with this guy who's about to be convicted not even of manslaughter because he got off because they slut shamed her but like who are these girls at that point at least i was at, at least i had kind of come to grips with the fact that he was a bad person but i mean i look at that and he had the same girlfriend for 35 years he just he got her he just got out of well. He got out of prison again a few years ago, and and he got this other girl hooked on drugs and ruined her life. And she's been with him since his trial. Right. Well, that girl, the Sean Sean Cavell, Co- I guess. Cavell. I don't know. I never she know was in the video. Yeah, she was in one of the girls. She's one of the girls in the video. So then he goes and goes to the trial, and like I said before, they destroys they Jennifer Levin's reputation. Made up a story about her having a sex diary. It was like a file of facts. There was nothing in it. Right. They said that she had a sex diary when, in fact, it was just a little notebook with people's phone numbers. Yeah, it was and like absurd. dates of things like going to get ice cream. Like yeah. literally nothing about like sex conquests or anything. But it was like on the cover of the New York Post every single day. Sex diary, Jen's sex diary, rough sex, sex diary, sex yes. diary, sex diary, all the time. About what a you know slut she was, and she was aggressive, and she was this. And oh, that. like these were the titles from the Met, from New York Daily News: How Jennifer Courted Death, Sex Play Got Rough, Preppy Murder. Um, yeah. Oh, and the other part, okay, that was interesting towards the end was um, okay. So now the trial ha- is happening, and the jury deliberates for nine days, and I guess they they could. They couldn't come to a, a unanimous decision, which would then mean they would have to do a mistrial, which means they'd have to do a whole other trial again. So I guess at that point, his defense attorney convinced him to try to do a plea. Well, the family, they didn't like, and Linda Fairstein, who was the prosecutor, I think didn't want the family to have to endure what they'd already again. done because it had been so long and so horrible for them and her that they just decided we can't do another. We just, they couldn't do it. And and the likelihood that they would have come up. I mean, this guy, he was probably having like, he was probably making eyes with people on the jury. I mean, like that's the kind of, it's like a Ted Bundy thing. Like yes. I really think that when you are you good looking. Do you recall if he ever took the stand? He did not. Okay. I don't think he did, but I wasn't there. At that right. point I was in college and I'd sort of checked out of the whole thing and uh-huh. was doing my own personal journey of damage and yeah. 